you are here to join us and that you guys are here to join us. I am really excited about today, as I really am about every day, because it's another day to be alive and another day to live and live life and experience the goodness of God. Thank you so much for taking the time this morning to just join us. It means the world to me. It really, really does. And thank you again. I, I'm, I'm, I have to repent because I didn't get a chance to send out the teaching notes or the email this week. And so I apologize for all of that, but I will be on it today to, to update um, for all of you that, um, to get all the notes out to those of you that are standing with us. I, I apologize again, just uh, it was just a, a lot to do yesterday, and um, but I'm so very grateful that today you have joined us. I am really excited about today's message for a lot of reasons, and uh, and I'll get to share about that in just a little bit. I hope you've had a good week, and this past week was good for you, and this week begins, uh, today begins a brand new week, and I love the fact that in the first few hours of the first day of the week, we get to worship Jesus together and we get to pray together and we get to receive of his grace and his mercy together and it will carry us throughout this week i want to i want i want to just tell you something god is up to something in your life and i know that maybe the road has been hard to get here but i want you to know you're going to look back soon and you're going to see that it was worth everything you went through I just truly believe that, and I want you to hold on to that and know that God has great things in store for your life, for my life, and it's just a daily journey with Him. There's a reason. You know, when Jesus said, when you pray, and, you, and, and He taught the disciples to pray, He said, give us this day our daily bread. Bread is good today, and then tomorrow there's going to be a, a fresh loaf given to you for that day. None of us like to eat month-old bread because it gets all mildewy and ugly and it tastes horrible, it's stale. We love bread daily. And today when you awakened, there was a fresh stack, 24 hours of fresh new mercies for you, loving kindness and compassion, Lamentations 3. And I'm just telling you, today's a good day. It's going to be a really, really good day. No matter what happens, I want you to know that He's with you. And so, Father, I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, on this first day of the week, in the first few hours of the day, that literally sets our whole week into motion, Father, I thank you for every single person who's going to be watching the, 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 the message today. The, and for those that will watch later throughout the week, Lord, a few moments ago, I asked you that you would specifically pick the people that need to hear this word and that you would specifically send the people who need to be here. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that today something will awaken in our hearts to who you are. Father, we have all kinds of images and views of you and some of them are just from our experience, whether good or bad. But today, Lord, as we open your word, I love that your word is alive. I love that your word is powerful. I love that your word literally divides between the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow that your word literally knows the intents of our hearts, even our thoughts. That you sent your word and you healed them, Psalms 107.20 declares. And you delivered them from all their destruction. There is so much power in your word. There is life in your word. So I ask you to open our eyes to your word open our ears to your spirit and that in all that we do today in all that we do in the next few moments in our thoughts in our wording in our attitude Lord that we do it all to honor you 
who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that today, as we lift you up, you said, Jesus, you said that you will draw all men to you, to yourself, and that's what we want. So in everything we do, Lord, in everything we do, we honor you. We honor you. I'm going to just ask you to just take a moment here in this room and just what you are watching. Please just take this moment right now. Just lift your hands however you want to lift them. And just offer him your life. Just offer him your life. Honor him. Begin to thank him for all that he's done and brought you through the things that you escaped, how he took care of things, how he watched over you. Just begin to thank him, begin to thank him, begin to thank him for all that you've done, for all that you've done, for all that you've done. Lord, we honor you for all the gifts that you bestowed upon us. Those that we use and those that we've not used, Lord, we honor you with those gifts. We honor you with the very breath that we breathe. We thank you for every blessing in our life. We even thank you for the trials in our life. We don't thank you for those circumstances. We thank you in those circumstances. In all of it, you're drawing us closer to you. So, Lord, today, we honor you with everything inside of us. I pray that our hearts and our souls and our mind and our strength will worship you and you alone because you are the only one deserving. Touch your people with your presence. Lord, it's all I ask for. Touch your people with your presence. Those that need healing, heal them. Those that need a miracle, Father, just bless them with that miracle. Whether it's emotional or physical or financial or marital or relational, God, I pray in Jesus' name that your presence we may be miles apart. We may be in different states and different nations. But right now, Lord, I ask that your presence will invade that space. And like a cocoon, you would literally, Lord, surround them with your presence. That they will know that no matter how far we may be apart, that your spirit knows no time or distance and that you are everywhere and that you are with us and we're in this together. So Father, I pray for your presence to be poured out upon us as we worship you with all of us. This morning, all of me will worship you. So bring everything into order and into alignment so that when I worship, my mind is not wandering. My mind is fixed on you. And I thank you, Jesus, for what you're about to do today in our lives. Receive all the glory and all the honor. Thank you for Trey. Thank you for the team in the back. Thank you for those that are here. Thank you for those that are watching. In all of it, Lord, I give you my deepest gratitude. I love you so much, Jesus. Bless us as we honor you. We worship you because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I, I am so grateful. I'm so grateful for his presence. 
And so as as we worship, guys, you can stand here. You can, if you want to, you can just stand or at home just to lift your hands. And I'm just going to ask that just set your gaze, your heart on Him as Trey leads us in worship. Something good, something good is going to happen in your life today. In the name of Jesus, amen. View of who you are. We have longed, we have so longed to know this grace the graciousness of who you are we cannot fathom we've allowed our traumas our abuses our skewed views our prisons our pain our setbacks the hurts and the wounds We've allowed those things to give us a view of you that isn't true, not close. We've been kept from your word, being distracted to the very things that are not important in our life. The enemy has done an amazing job of keeping us so busy so that we simply have a skewed view of who you are. We have not understood your grace, and yet we long for it. We were saved because of it through faith. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that today our eyes will be opened not from a dream, not from one man's insight or revelation, but from your word that does not return to you void, empty, fruitless, but it, it accomplishes the very thing that you sent it to do. That when we open your word today, we will see it with new eyes. We will receive it with a new heart, hungry, desperate for who you are. We don't, we don't want to know about you through someone else. We want to know you like Moses, who said his desire was to stand face to face with you, to know you, not to know your power, but to know your person. Who are you? God, who are you? So I ask you to show us from your word. Because if we say that we want to be like you, it can't be left to our imagination or to religion or to man-made traditions that make the word of God to no effect. It is your word. Your word that keeps us alive, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So I ask you to give us a hunger for your word. Give us eyes to see it, untainted, unskewed by our experiences or by the teachings of others. Lord, today, I ask that those that hear my voice will encounter your grace 
in a new and living way, a way that will radically change them. That where sin, Paul said, abounds, there, there where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So open our eyes to your truth, not our skewed truth, not subjective truth, but objective truth that does not change. Father, we thank you for your grace upon us. And I pray for even one, just one today, that will encounter your grace in such a new and living way that their life will be forever changed because of your word that breaks the traditions of men and the doctrines of men. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Guys, I love you so much. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. I just believe with all of my heart that God is going to do something so very special. And the message today is going to really, it's, it, we're going to address this. Who is he? Who is he? Who is this gracious God? So please get your Bibles. Open them to Psalms 145. We're going to read that psalm completely through. And you're just, we're going to hit line by line, verse by, like Isaiah said, line upon line, precept upon precept. So whether you have your, your physical Bible, you know, like this, that we should read daily, get it in our life. This isn't a novel. This is the Word of God. This is your manual, my manual to life. I always think of this. That Jesus, the Bible says in John, that Jesus is the Word. How the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That the Son of God is the Word of God. But when Jesus was on the earth, Jesus opened the Scriptures in Luke 12. And He literally was reading the very verses that you and I read. If the Word of God, being Christ, opened the Word of God, being the Logos, imagine how much you and I need to open this Word and get back, rebuild the altar of reading the Word and allowing the Spirit of God to reveal things to us that, and I appreciate all of the teachers and pastors and all of the prophets and everybody that teaches the Word of God, but there is no greater teacher in your life nor mine than the Holy Spirit who inspired it all. And so we're going to open this Word, and whether it's on your phone, that's, I love the technology, but for those of us that are the older style, older people, young or old, there's nothing like opening the pages of this book. Every answer to every question is found in it. And so today we're going to go to Psalms 145, and we're going to go through it. And we're just going to walk through it. And we're going to learn from the Word, not a dream I had, not some revelation, literally right here and we're going to go line by line through it and you're going to get to see what God is actually like so the whole message is focused on the graciousness of God and somebody today I don't know who you are and I don't know your dilemma but you're going to encounter the grace of God in a way that you have never encountered him in your life get ready open your heart prepare your heart to receive this word because it's not a novel this is not a cute story this is a life changing book and it's about time that we got back into it and not just read it like a novel but allow the truths in it to change our life because they will i love you guys so very much thank you again for joining us i'll be right back just watch the video i appreciate you so very much 
TGP family, we're so excited to see how many of you watch from all over the country and the world. Even though we're all in different places, we're still a family. We would love to connect with you and be able to put a face to your name. You might be watching from a coffee shop or sitting on the couch with your dog. You might even be having a watch party with your friends and family. No matter where you are, we want to see how you watch our TGP service. Here's what you can do. Grab your phone, post a picture of wherever you're watching from, and use the hashtag MyTGPView. You can tag all of our socials in the picture as well so we can stay connected with you in the future. Oh, <laughs> that's a great way to start a message to like to start, you know, you're going to share the word and just, to, you know, go. Ugh. anyways, I love you guys. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for joining for joining us. And um, I love our church family. I love I just so between, you know, when you guys are watching the video, I'm just out hanging with them and talking to them. And I thought there was actually another video, but there wasn't. So I rushed back to my spot, which is right here. Anyways, um, I pray that the Lord will touch our hearts this morning. Next Sunday, by the way, next Sunday, we are gonna we're gonna start we're gonna implement monthly communion, and so next Sunday we're gonna have communion together, and I'm just gonna allow the Lord to lead the whole thing, and so we will have the you know of course we'll have the the bread and the cup the elements here, and I pray for those of you that are are gonna be um, joining us, uh, that you can join us um, online, but even better. Uh, in person. So we have room for you, and it would be wonderful to see uh, some of your faces again. I've missed some of you so much. And I, again, I, I love I love the screen, and I, God is using the screen, but I never want to, I never want the screen to replace our face-to-face -face encounters, because that's where life happens. And, um, and so I just pray that you'll join us next Sunday. Come, it's, it's, if it's been a while, and um, and just again, but communion next Sunday, and I'm just, I really believe this is going to probably turn into at least a two-part message, and um, so this, this word about the graciousness of God has just been on my heart for the last couple of weeks, and so we've been in a series called Rebuilding Life, and my whole, my whole focus this year is to hold up your lamp, and uh, because of the things that God has in store for us in 2021. And, and the whole word for me for 2021 is rebuilding your future. And we began the year looking at the book out of the, we started reading out of the book of Nehemiah. And, and of course, there's so much there that I just touched on some things. And then we went from, you know, reading the book of Nehemiah to then, you know, looking at how re Nehemiah encourages us to rebuild because that's actually the best book in the Bible to, that ha has anything to do with rebuilding. But the last couple of weeks, this, this whole theme about the graciousness of God has been just, it's just been brewing in my heart. And I've been waiting for the Lord's timing on it. And so I felt like today was the right day. And, and yesterday, as I just dove into it, it just utterly overwhelmed me. And so I pray that, you know, all of us have had our journey with the Lord. Many of us have walked with God for many years. And our, maybe our concept of grace has not been accurately um, instilled in us, like God's Word, and there's so much about the grace of God, and it, it, literally you can spend a lifetime teaching about God's grace. And so I want to read you a quote that I, I read by a, a young man by the name of Carlos Rodriguez, and it's just very powerful. He said, for too long, Christian, Christians use the Bible as a weapon and not as a mirror, the gospel for oppression instead of liberation the church as a judgmental gavel and not a table of inclusion. 
and Jesus as their mascot instead of the example. It's time, he said, to flip the tables. And I believe it is time to flip the tables. And so we, we know that the scriptures, anytime you open this word, we know that this word proclaims that God is a gracious God. But many of us struggle in understanding the graciousness of who he is. While some will actually wonder what grace actually looks like. And so Psalms 145 is where we're going to go. We're going to read it verse by verse. I'm going to read it out of the NIV translation for a reason. And so I'm, I want to begin the message by reading a lot of verses to you, and I appreciate Samuel getting them all in there. And the key verses actually will, will begin at verse 8 and down to verse 21, but I want to read the whole chapter, and so if you can just follow along with me. And, and I, want you to, I want you to note how many times the writer of Hebrews 145, David, I want you to note how many times he uses the word all. And so in your, in your translation, it may not be as many as the NIV, but I just want you to notice something. So here's what he says. Verse 1, I will extol you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the, of, of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyful singing of your righteousness. Verse 8. I want you to notice this verse. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. Now note the word all from verse 9 on. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that he has made. All your works praise you. He says, all your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful, your faithful people extol you. Love that. Your faithful people extol you. He goes on and he says, they will tell of the glory, verse 11, they will tell of, of, of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all the people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all that he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes, the eyes of all who look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at their proper time. You open, you open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all His ways and faithful in all He does. The Lord is, verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear Him. He hears their cry and saves them. Verse 20, the Lord watches over all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. My mouth, verse 21, my mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Okay, so in the NIV, you, you, if, you know, of course, in your translation, it may be less or more, but in the NIV, the word all is mentioned 15 times. And so, so my thought is that, you know, when you first meet someone, you get an initial impression. You get an instant impression of who they are when, you know, by, you know, the way they look at you, eye contact, tone of voice, what they say, if they smile. And, and sometimes it's actually easy to get a false picture um, or a negative one when you first meet someone. So first impressions last. And so how you meet someone you get a, that instant impression of who they are. 
But then when you get to know that person, often they're not anything like you first imagined or maybe even after that first impression. And if you're, if you're anything like me, you tend to let your imagine run away with you or run with you. And then so what happens is that life either becomes like a fantasy world, like a Disney world, or it becomes a prison. And, and it, because often the way you see life is, is the way that you've imagined it, right? And that's why it is so important to remember when Paul said the importance of renewing your mind according to God's word. And so I think even as believers, we get sucked into this fantasy world, a, a world of a Sunday school kind of teaching. We all, you know, for most of us, we, we were raised in Sunday school. And, you know, you've got the story of David and Goliath, and you've got the story of Jonah and the whale. And then, you know, you've got the, the story of Jericho. But, you know, but there's, a, there's almost like a fantasy thing when some of these books are written or the way they're taught. Um, many of us, you know, remember Jesus being, you know, we're seeing pictures of Jesus with a little halo over his head. And so, like, again, it, we, we've sort of, uh, how we viewed life and God comes, uh, sometimes is determined by the images that we've seen. You know, there's, I, I remember seeing, a, um, you know, back in, back in the day, but there was a little book written for kids, you know, and, and Goliath, David, it's a story of David and Goliath, and Goliath was, a, was actually smiling. And I'm thinking, that's not an accurate view of Goliath. Um, you know, or the story of Jericho, but it's a bloodless Jericho. And again, I understand it's Sunday school, but, but even for adults. And so, so my question is, how much of our knowledge of God and our experience of God is based on a fantasy world or is actually, or it's, it's, it's it, the way we view him is from a prison because we've been hurt, we've been wounded. The church system has affected us, it has hurt us, it has set us back and we can just, all of us have those different experiences. But, but what is the truth about God? And that's my main thing today is, who is he? And what is he actually like? Do we have a fantasy view of him or do we have a prison view of him? Some will think of him like a religious, you know, like a religious school master, you know, or if you grew up in a certain denomination and you went to, you know, Christian school and a, or private and back in the day and you know sometimes a nun would have that ruler or you know or your school your private school principal you know it was very it was very disciplined and so your view of God can be somewhat skewed by the way that you were raised and so you know some of us may have the idea or like he's a manipulative factory worker. He's just a taskmaster and he, you know, he's like this old guy that is, you know, there in heaven with a club just waiting for you to fail so he can literally just knock you over the head. And then you have people that stroll into church Sunday after Sunday or they stroll into church every Christmas and New Year's or, you know, and every Christmas or Easter. They say their prayers if their life is tough, but then they blame God when things go wrong. And otherwise, they, they just go on with their lives and really don't give spiritual matters a second thought. But my question again is, who is he? And what is, the, what is, the, what is God actually like so that I can plant my life in his truths and then build my life from that foundation. And so this psalm helps us actually understand what God is really like and what really matters in life. And I think the older you get, your life goes from a buckshot to a bullet. And the older you get, you sort of begin to focus on what really matters in life. And the key verse is verse 8. And he says, the Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord is gracious and merciful. And so I want us to focus this morning just on the word gracious, or some translations will say loving kindness. So I want to focus this morning on the graciousness of God, the loving kindness of God. And I wonder if, if, if you know any people who, do you know anyone in your life that when you tried to describe them, you would describe them as gracious? 
Um, that meaning that they're compassionate and they're kind and they're friendly and they're helpful and they're merciful. Do you have anyone in your life like that? Because that will actually help you begin to understand and grasp who God is. Um, you'll probably say that you do know someone, but they may not always be gracious. It may be intermittent. But God's graciousness does not change with circumstances. The grace of God is not like the grace of man. And I find it so funny and ironic that we all want to be like God. We pray to Him. We, all of us, you know, we can collectively say we have prayed many prayers over the years, but then we, we're not like Him. And I'm thinking, what the heck? What is wrong with us that we pray to this God who is so gracious and we ask him, Lord, help me become more like you. I want to be more like you, Jesus. I want to be more like you, God. And then we actually don't do. And, and, and so last night I had a, a the, I always have this honor and I'm on a, a Zoom call. And and so with Brian and Vinita Ford and. And so I get this privilege every Saturday night, and we just have a, a prayer call. And on this call, the last I've done it like for the last four weeks, and I, with them, and I'm so honored, and it's just wonderful. Like it's just such a new experience for me. I'm I'm not much of a Zoom person, but but I I, I just I've really enjoyed um, these last four weeks with with them and and with the people that are on the call. And so last night, and this is so funny because I, well, this is not in here. This is not. This was not planned to share about this. But last night we were talking about um, the importance of repetition. And so I, 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 I pulled out a message that I, a series that I did some years ago called the the life changing power of habits. And so we were talking about the importance of repetition. And and so it was just so amazing because, you know, when we we're talking, just simply talking about the word repetition. And I thought, and so yesterday as I was sharing, let me get to the point. So yesterday as I was, I was sharing, you know, we all, we all, we, we, we have habits in our life. We, all of us have developed good and bad habits. And, and so, so, so last night I was challenging all of us. You know, we believe something, but we don't behave. We don't be behave in the way that we believe. And that simply means that there's a disconnect between our believer and our behavior. And so there's a disconnect between, because with the heart one believes, but with the, with the mind one behaves. And so there's something, there's a disconnect because we believe something, but then we're not behaving in the way that we believe, which is a real turn off to the world. Because they, they know that we're to be believers and we are to love. And let me just go back to the quote again, uh, because I think it's just that good. For, for, for too long, this is going back to that quote at the beginning of the, of the message. For too long, Christians use the Bible as a weapon and not as a mirror. Like, imagine if we all just took time and rather than using the Bible to hit somebody over the head with and judge them with, why don't we actually, because it is a mirror, why don't we actually take that mirror and make and, and face it, you know, where we're looking into that mirror going, what needs to change in me? Where, where am I arrogant? Where am I prideful? Where am I jealous or envious? Or where am I in by rude and angered? Like, rather than using it on, it, it, right, there's that saying, like, we, 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 we judge people who sin differently than we do. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the, you know, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Like, come on, let's, let's get real with ourselves. But we, you know, we're not transparent with ourselves, so we want to just project all that judgment and all that nonsense on other people. But the truth is, every time you do that, rest assured, Jesus said, by the same measure of judgment you make on others, it will be measured back to you. I mean, so we have a choice. Jesus said we can either fall on the rock, right, and be broken, or the rock is going to fall, fall on us and we're going to be crushed. So I'd rather just fall on the rock and say, you know what, there's things in me that need to change. There's things. So there's, there's things that I believe, but I'm not behaving. And that literally is because we have not become or that we've developed, created habits that are unhealthy. But in the same way, that, and this is what we were talking about last night, in the same way that you've developed good habits or bad habits, you can actually develop good habits. 
like where you just get very intentional because a, a habit is whatever you repeatedly do. So if you are repeatedly, if you're repeatedly angry, then it really, you know, telling people that you love Jesus, but you're always angry, that doesn't go in line with what you believe because your behavior is actually dictating a different message. And I think this is why messages like this are important. Because, so he's, let me go back. So for too long, Christians have used the Bible as a weapon, not as a mirror. The gospel of oppression instead of liberation. The church as a judgmental gavel, and I experienced that personally myself. The church as a judgmental gavel, not a table of inclusion. And Jesus as their mascot instead of the example. It's time to flip the tables. And I believe it is time to flip the tables. And I believe God is going to have a way of dealing with us in a very, very stern way where when we are, when we are spewing or projecting things on others and we're not actually living the truth of what His Word is. Like, what do we actually believe? And so I just, again, I think where this begins is I need to ask God, help me, change the inside of me. There's things in me that I'm not pleased with. And so, Lord, if I've, if I've been a certain way, help me change that because I, don't, I want to behave according to what I believe. And so between my heart and my mind, there needs to be a connection so that I can implement what you act, who you are so that when I walk out into the world, I am actually reflecting you and I'm not reflecting the system or I'm not, I'm not, you know, you're either attracting people as far as like your relationship with God, people are either going to be attracted to you or repelled from you. And I'm telling you, if there's anything, we've got to awaken to this truth. We are ambassadors of reconciliation. That's, that's who Paul, every single one of us, you're, all of us are called into the ministry, and our first ministry is to be ambassadors of reconciliation. So, again, how you see God will determine how you behave. And if you see God as a schoolmaster and, you know, like a, with that ruler or a factory owner who is just going to be, who's going to manipulate and use and abuse his, his, his employees, then again, we, we will struggle with ever being anything like God because that's how we see him. And so here's why this, this, so David begins in this psalm and he says, the Lord is gracious and merciful. That's verse eight. And so the, when, when, unlike us, we are gracious, but sometimes circumstances become so like they 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 become so overwhelming that we lose we lose that characteristic. And so David said again, the Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord is gracious and merciful. And I'm repeating it for a reason, because the graciousness of God does not change with circumstances. And so Nehemiah 9 helps us actually understand God's character even more so. He says in verse 17 in the second part of verse 17, he says this, but you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and merciful, slow to become angry and rich in unfailing love. You do not abandon them. Okay, so who is God? He's telling us, God, you, but you are a God of forgiveness, gracious, merciful, slow to become angry, rich in unfailing love, and you will never abandon us. You will never leave us. Another translation says you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. So again, if we are going to represent God in that world, we've got to get our believer and our behavior in line, right? So that when we, are, when we share about the love of Christ, when we share about the love of God, this is the God that people are wanting to connect with. He is rich and he's he's rich and he's abundant in love. He's forgiving. He's gracious. He's merciful. Slow to anger. Rich and rich and and rich in unfailing love. He will never leave you. He'll never abandon you. So again, we've got to get that connection between our believer and our behavior because I think a lot of us believe it, but we're not behaving it. And so we've got to get back to, you know, just get back into time with God to say, Lord, I want what I believe to become my behavior. 
every single day. And so, now, Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, there is a special or an uncommon grace that is reserved for those who have received the gift of redemption through Christ, for, so, for those of us that have chosen to follow him. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, listen to what Paul says. Therefore, since we have been, ra- since we have been made right in the sight of, in the, I'm sorry, since we've been ra- made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God. So I want you to note this. So since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Verse 2, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege, favor, or grace, where now we stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. All right, so I want you just to note a couple of things from these two verses. Peace with God through faith in Christ. Peace with God through faith in Christ. And then he says, and then we gain this grace by which we now stand. All right, peace with God, faith in Christ. Now we gain this grace in this, in this place where we now stand. So grace cannot be accessed in any other way except through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the only way that grace can be accessed in your life and mine, where you can have peace with God through faith in Christ, now to gain this grace in which we now stand. You and I, we, every, you and I stand in this place in our faith as a, because of our relationship with the Son of God. All right, so what is this gracious God like? For The Father gives good gifts to His children. We know that. Jesus said that. So unless God, unless you know God as your Father, you're not going to understand the good gifts that He has for you. It's like like asking someone else's Father to be gracious to you. God wants to have a personal relationship with you so that you can know His graciousness on your life. And so Psalms 145 gives us a very clear picture, not of God's personality, but of God's character, okay? Our personalities can change. Our character determines everything in our life. So personality is the way we behave in front of others, but it changes. Character is the the way we behave when no one is watching. So again, you know, we can, we can close the door and pretend, you know, once that door is closed, we go back to being, you know, who we were, but then what we present out there is not real. It's, it's just a, a, because we're making it about us and our reputation and how we look, but the true you is when that door is closed and those lights are off, that's the truest of you. God wants to make sure that the person we project and the person that we are out there is also the one in that dark room. And that's why our believer and our behavior has to connect. And that's simply by how we approach life and the things that we do in our life that that really matter the most. Because at the end of the day, guys, at the end of the day, how much money you made isn't gonna matter. How big or small your house is isn't gonna matter. What car you drove isn't going to matter. Here's what's going to matter. Two things. What you've done with the gifts that God gave you, right? Whatever that gift is that he's placed on your life and how you touched people's lives. That's why giving is so important because it is actually the seed that remains and there's a harvest on that seed. Like that's, that's the only thing you take with you into God's kingdom. It's the only thing that you, le- when you leave this planet, you take none of all the things that you worked so hard to get. You leave it all behind. None of it goes with you. Except what you've sown into the kingdom and what you've done with what God has given you. And that's why, to me, like this is why it's so important to come back to center. Like be balanced. Right? We love God and we love people. And so, you know, again, I want to make sure that when I'm out there and I'm sharing with people about the love of Jesus, I'm, I'm also the same guy that's in that dark room, you know, walking his journey with God. So it's not about my reputation. It is actually about his. Because people can see through all your crap. I mean, people can see through it, especially, you know, people that have been around for a while. 
And so, again, personality is the way we behave in front of others, but character is the way we behave when no one is watching. And so, again, so this morning, as I'm referring to God's unchanging character, my question is, who is he? That's what I'm referring to. Who is he? All right, so here's, here's, here's who he is according to Psalms 145. He is slow to anger. Verse 8. So we can sometimes make our, our, you know, our, our bad temper a badge of honor. And it, I, I was in a conversation with somebody not too long ago, and they actually said to me, they said that they're fed up with, with trying to be patient. You know, anger, anger, righteous anger is justified by God, but a bad temper is not. And so he's he to anger. So you've got to make sure that when, when you're dealing with righteous anger, that you're slow to it, right? You're not, you're not just spewing something out that you need to retract and then, you know, that it's sort of left out there for a while. So who is God? This gracious, what is this graciousness about? Well, he is slow to anger. And so if we're going to be like him, we need to be slow to anger. Then he abounds in steadfast love. I want you to note something about this, that he abounds in steadfast love. What does that word steadfast actually mean? It means firm. It means fixed. It means unyielding. Listen, when God loves you, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his love for you is firm. It is fixed. It is unyielding. You, you, listen, there is nothing you can do right now to, for him to love you any more or love you any less. He is not just love you. He's so in love with you. And that love is fixed. It's firm. It's unyielding because it is a steadfast love. And that's the love that you and I need to be able to walk in and share with others. And so, because we're going to experience many forms of love while we are, you know, in, this, in these bodies of ours, but God's love is so unique. It's, it's an agape love. There's, there's four different loves that we see in Scripture. And this is, this, and I'm going to, well, I got to teach on that one day, but, but God's love is unique. God's love is agape. It's unconditional. All right. So, he abounds in steadfast love. He's, he's slow to anger. He abounds in steadfast love. All right. Who is he? I love this because it says he's good to all. He's good to all. So what does that mean? Well, it's easy to be good to those who are good to you. But God is good to all regardless of their responses. Think about that. It is so easy for us to get along with people who think like us, pray like us, believe what we believe. But are we as good to the people who don't look like us, who don't believe what we believe, who don't talk like us? And so, again, God is good to, if we're going to be like God, to everyone that he, our world. Jesus said that loving those who love you is easy. It's loving those who don't love you. That's not easy. I'm always challenged internally when Jesus said, you know, love your enemies. Like, yeah, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> You're God. But I want to tell you something. There's a freedom that comes. And there was a lot of years where I did not love my enemies. I had, mm, yeah, I thought of ways to let them meet their God early. But I want to tell you something. It only kept me bound. When you can begin to love your enemies and actually bless them, it sets you free from their control, their words, their manipulation, and you're just able to say, you know what, no matter what you do or say to me, I love you. And I ask God to bless you and deal with you because I know this, vengeance doesn't belong to me. And the way that the Lord will deal with people is far more severe than anything you and I can do that won't send us to jail or prison. All right, so he's good to all. Here's another thing about God. He has compassion over all. 
God doesn't want anyone to perish. The word perish actually means to shrivel up or to waste away. He is compassionate over all. That means over all his creation. That means over all his creation. If they're not our skin color, if they're not our faith, if they're creatures, God has compassion over everything. That's why it, you cannot, you cannot be a Christian and a racist. Impossible. Your Christianity is, 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 is false. It's false and it's deceiving. Because I've always lived, you know, I've shared this several times. I just simplify, really try to simplify things in my life. And, and here's the way I operate. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If I believe that God created in the beginning, he created everything in heaven and in earth, then I, if I value that creation as God's creation, then the way I see it will be it's valuable. It's valuable to God. He created it. But if I don't believe that God created, it, you know, that God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and if I then don't value, and that to me is just how I can look at people and go, you say you believe in God, but your behavior actually tells me you don't value what he values. Because if you can hate somebody that's a different skin color than you, then you don't see them as God's creation. So you're going to value one color over another, but yet God created all of us. Or even look at creation itself. From the smallest thing to nature to the like He created all of it for you and I to enjoy. And then man was his crowning, the crowning of his creation was mankind. And so if, if we, you can't just have compassion on a certain group of people. It's, it says he has compassion over all. And so he doesn't want anyone to shrivel up. He doesn't want anyone to waste away because that's the word perish. It actually means to shrivel. So that's why Jesus came and died for all of us. All right, so let me, th this, is, this is not, I added this this morning. There's a difference between sympathy, empathy, and compassion, and this is important. All right, so compassion, he has compassion over all. What does that mean? All right, let me show you the difference. If you have, write this down, because I, I know it will help you. All right, so we need to move from sympathy to empathy to compassion, because sometimes what we do is we have sympathy, which is distant, right? We tell people, okay, when people, when we, want, when we sympathize with somebody, we say, I'm sorry you're in your, I'm sorry for the pain that you're feeling. I'm, I'm sorry you're in pain. That's distant. We can do that on a phone call. We can write that in a message. It's distant. I'm sorry you're in pain. Sympathy. Empathy is, I can imagine what the, I, I can't imagine what this pain feels like. Now it's shared. So I, or I can imagine what this pain is like because I've been through it. So again, we, are, we wanna move from sympathy, being distant. Oh, I can't, you listen, I'm so sorry for the pain that you're in. I'm distant, I, I'm not in it. Now empathy is, listen, I, I can imagine what this pain is like. I know I've been on that same, and now that's shared. I know what it feels like. All right, there's, so we go from sympathy to empathy. Now there's one step further that because it, it, he is compassionate over all. The thing that is so missing in the church is this one word, compassion. All right, what's compassion? Compassion is you're suffering and I will do whatever I can to help. What does that mean? That means now we're connected and there's action, it's, it's action oriented. I'm not gonna be distant. I'm not just gonna say, I share in your pain. Now I'm gonna say to you, I'm gonna walk alongside of you to make sure that you feel God's love and that he is with you. So we're, gonna, we're not just gonna share this, we're gonna actually act upon it. And I'm here to tell you, whatever I can do to help you in this situation, because the same way that God has been compassionate to me, I want to share my compassion with you. Jesus had compassion over those that were around him and literally virtue left him because of the compassion he had for the sick. So imagine if we as believers just walk, if we want to be like God, then we need to be compassionate because otherwise 
we simply are believing something, but we're not behaving it. And so there's actually a disconnect between our hearts and our minds. And, you know, it's just so important to connect. There's got to be that connector between the heart and the mind. And so compassion isn't for the weak. It isn't for the weak-hearted. It requires to act. It requires an act of will on, on, on our part to demonstrate, to make sure that people know that we care. You and I can decide to be compassionate or we can decide not to be. But if we're going to decide not to be compassionate, we can't tell people we're true Christians. True Christianity is compassionate Christianity. I love the next part. It says he, he upholds all who fall. So many people feel like, you know, right now, it just a lot of people feel like the, you know, the bottom has fallen out in their world. And we never know what's going on behind closed doors. You know, people will present one thing, but then we don't really know what's going on. And so, you know, you can, you can look upon the crowd and you see their faces lit up, but what you won't see is the heartache behind those smiles. And so I love this because the Lord upholds all who are falling. Wow, imagine what the church world would look like. Imagine what the Christian world would look like if we were just like him in this, that we uphold those who are falling. It's, it's so funny, you know, we all know this because the church is the only entity in the world that shoots its wounded. And I always love the fact that when Jesus was dealing, when the Pharisees were about to stone the woman caught in adultery, caught in adultery, what they were doing there, I don't know, but what they, were, they, she, they caught her in adultery. And so they come out because they're gonna, the law said stone her, right? And so what does Jesus do? So they throw her at the feet of Jesus to test him to see what is he going to do because the law says stone her. And I love what Jesus does. They throw, the, they, they, they throw the, the adulterous woman at his feet, and he gets between her and the Pharisees. And he literally bends down. He's on his knees. between. So in, in other words, he's protecting her from the religious system of that day that said she should be stoned and killed. And I think that's compassion in action and then you know the story he begins to write in the sand and they all drop their stones they had their stones in hand ready to stone her but compassion acts and the church is so good at throwing stones can we be the kind of people that actually catch the stones that are being thrown at people who are broken right instead of instead of stepping on the fallen he up he upholds all who are fallen and so again the importance of the sensitivity so how how we need to be sensitive um, to those who need a kind word for those who need a helping hand for those who are actually falling and maybe not even know they're falling again he's so compassionate he's so gracious to us I'm so glad. Oh, God, I'm so grateful for his compassion and his graciousness for my life. All right, the next thing he says is he raises up those who are, who are bowed. In other words, the world seeks to throw stones, uh, just, and they throw stones to condemn. And I'm not just going to say the world. The church is excellent at throwing stones. The church is excellent at condemning. The church is excellent at accusing. But listen to me. This is not going to be easy for some of you to hear, and you need to suck it up and change some of the ways and your attitudes. Because if you want to challenge me on this, go ahead. You cannot be an accuser of the brethren and then call yourself a Christian. Because only Satan accuses. End of story. End of story. So when, when he raises those whose heads are bowed, the world is good at throwing stones. The church is good at throwing stones. The world is good at condemning. The church is good at condemning. And yet Paul says, now therefore, Romans 8, there is, now therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. If there is no condemnation, why are we condemning? And so if, if uh, you know, unless you're the one that's actually being stoned, you need to drop your stone. Seriously, you need to stop throwing it because there's going to come a moment where God's going to deal with all of us in this. And again, I just go back to the importance of this because, you know, how could we, the church, say we are the church, 
But then we're operating in this, it, and uh, suck it up. It's demonic. It isn't, there is nothing religious about it. Well, I mean, it's religious, it can be slightly demonic. Is because we're so religious, right? We want to judge everybody else. The truth is, if you are accusing people, you are literally aligning yourself to the accuser of the brethren because that's exactly what Satan does. And so let's deal with it. Satan accuses. I want nothing to do with Satan. Jesus said, he has nothing. He has no part of me. Well, you know what? We've got to stop accusing people. We've got to, be, be, we've got to stop being accusatory and condemning and judgmental. But then somehow we present that we're holy and we're better than everybody else. Listen, I get that. I understand. And so there's, there, this is where the Lord then breaks us, right? He breaks us because that is going to be something that's going to hurt us. I mean, it could actually hurt our eternity if we're not careful. And so, yet, again, God wants, God wants to lift our heads. The enemy wants to literally cause us to walk with our heads bowed in shame. And so, he, he, so God wants to you know, lift our heads up to remind us that His love goes beyond our circumstances. His love goes beyond your failures. His love goes beyond your mistakes, even beyond your own foolishness. Think about that. God, think about that. That even in your mistakes and in your own foolishness, God says, listen, here's who I am. I will still hold your head up. I will raise those who are bowed. I Listen, you may fall seven times, but you're going to get back up again because I it's my righteousness in you, not your righteousness in me. And so that's why I say to you, it is so important. Don't ever give up on anybody because if God could save a Manasseh in the Old Testament who was such a wicked king, he killed so many people, so many people. He was so evil. He was so evil. And yet... God changed him. Don't ever give up on people. Catch the stone. Don't throw it. Comfort. Don't accuse. Because maybe, maybe that person that you, we're accusing, actually what they just need is to be loved back to life again. Right? We just need to breathe that life of God in them so that they can come back to life. They've had enough accusations. They've had enough people throwing stones and judging them and giving them the eye and giving them that shameful look. Get it. Get it. I get it. I get it. I've been there. And it's sickening. And if you don't think we know the look you're giving us, let me tell you, please look into my eyes if you want to. Well, you should because I'm on the camera. Look into my eyes. And I want to tell you something. I lived that for several years where I literally saw people when they were looking at me, they were shaming me through their look. And I had to allow the Lord to change me and heal me so that their shaming look didn't send me back in my shame. That's why I love what Brene Brown says. Don't share your story with just anybody. You share your story with those who have earned the right to hear it. Right? Just don't go telling everybody your mistakes. I'm going to tell you something. Even the ones, oh, we love you, praise the Lord. We just love you, praise the Lord. They're going to freaking stab you in the heart and the back and tell you, praise the Lord, while they do it. And never deal with their own sin. Never deal with their own shame because they're spending so much time shaming you, they don't have time to shame themselves. But I'm going to tell you something. The Lord will deal with them severely. Not, light, not lightly, severely. Because they know better, but they choose, they choose not to believe, not to behave what they believe. Right? We don't want God judging us, but we're so good at judging others. Well, I'm telling you, there's a day of reckoning coming. So let's make sure, let's just make sure that we're not accusatory. Because in the same way that we may be accusing others, the day will come when somebody will be accusing us. So if we're going to be like God, and I know I'm harping on this because I think it's just a nasty thing in the body of Christ, and it's evil. It's evil. Come on. It's evil. You can't put a Christian wording on it. It's just evil, and it's wrong, and it needs to stop, and it needs to stop with us. So if you've been accused, and I listen, I, I'm guilty. Stop accusing people. You know, and just because somebody fails, pray for them. Right? I mean, the difference between my failure and maybe your failure is... Everybody knew about mine because it was publicized. So now imagine your failure being publicized. Oh, now, now it's a bit different, isn't it? Ooh. Yeah, good. Glad I took that for you. All right. 
So God wants to even in our foolishness, I'm going to wrap this up, even in our foolishness, He wants to lift us up. I love that. I love Acts 2.21 says this, For all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They just have to call all, right? The all of the graciousness of God. Now all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just to call his name, that name that speaks life. And, 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 and I love this because we know him by his name. And so whosoever shall call on that name, Jesus, shall be saved. If you speak to someone, you know, if I speak to somebody, I know them well. I use his name or her name in my conversation. But if I don't know the person well, I'll, hey, brother, hey, sister, how, you're right, because I, I don't know their name. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I know who he is. I know his name. I call him by his name, and then the, the result is salvation. And so, all right, so let me, let, me just, and let me just get to this. All right. To understand then the character of God, we must look at Jesus of Nazareth. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we must look to Jesus, who is literally all the names of God in the Old Covenant are all found in his name, all of them in one name, Jesus. And so the one who was in, in literally in the very nature, God, but yet this God, Jesus, takes on the form of a servant and humbles himself even unto death even the cross. And so there's little wonder than why the psalmist said, my mouth will speak the praise, my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. All right, as I wrap this up, today people aren't satisfied with words. David said, my mouth will speak, whosoever shall call on the name shall be saved. But people today aren't satisfied with words. They want evidence. They want proof. But where will they find evidence of the graciousness of God today? Where will they find the love of Christ today? And the answer is simple, and yet it's scary. Because they will find the graciousness of God and experience the love of Jesus first and foremost in you, and in me. That's why we are ambassadors of His grace. We are ambassadors of mercy. We are ambassadors of His love. And so all those who dare to call themselves disciples of Christ, then again, we are to be ambassadors of His grace, ambassadors of His love, and to make sure that what we're projecting, so if so how then do we measure up to this, to, to really be Christ's representatives? Because people primarily experience the character of God through any contact between you and you know between you and I and them. And so it is our responsibility. I want to wrap this up right here. Trey, if you can make your way in here, buddy. All right, so so how do I measure up? How do I measure up? How do you and I measure up where, you know, and I, because I think we need to take this super, like this is a, uh, this, this is a huge responsibility for us because people primarily are going to experience the graciousness of God and the love of Christ through connecting, communicating, conversing with you and I. And so I'm, I'm reminded of, okay, Exodus 3, Exodus 34, sorry, Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. And the Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I love this. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Verse 7, I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. 
I lay the sins of their parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generation. Man, you think about how strong that is. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. That's why this is so serious, because a curse can go three and four generations. Christianity, the grace behind our Christian faith, is critical because there's no other religion in the world that emphasizes divine grace the way the Bible does. James 4 and verse 6 says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But God gives more grace. He resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I don't know about you. I want some more grace. I need more grace. We need, what we need is the grace of God on our lives. And grace is a word that capsulizes all of God's undeserved blessings in our lives. His power, forgiveness, blessing, compassion, help, love, redemption, mercy. We need grace to change. That's why it is so important to build your life and to know the graciousness of Him, who He is. That your view and my view of Him isn't either a fantasy land or Disney World experience or a prison, but in who He is. And I pray today that you will experience His grace on your life, that between your believer and your behavior, that missing connection, God will fuse together. I'm sorry for all the pain that you've been through, and I mean this to all of you in this room to all of you that are watching. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for whatever has caused you to go through trauma and abuse and setbacks. I'm sorry if you were raised in a home where love wasn't unconditional but conditional. I'm sorry for what others have done to you and I'm sorry for what you've done to others. We need the grace of God to change us. We can't change ourselves. We need grace to clean up the mess in our hearts that we've created or that others created in us. We need grace to clean up the mess of pride in our lives. Apart from God's grace, we can do nothing And so there needs to be a a new hunger in our hearts for the grace of God. And so why I love what James said, he said, but he will give more grace. But God gives more grace, not just grace, but he, you see it on the screen, he gives more grace. He says, therefore, he said, God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. But wait, I'm saved by grace through faith. It's unmerited, correct. But yet God will even give more grace because he resists the I, me. He resists the proud, but he lavishes even more grace 
on the humble. Proverbs 3, verse 3, and I close. Verse 3 and 4 of Proverbs 3 says, Let truth and mercy not forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Think about it. Let truth and mercy not forsake you. Bind them around your neck like a, like a cross or a chain or, you know, whatever you, like a, like a what, you know, and, and, and around your, bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. And he says, and here you'll find favor, you'll find grace, and high esteem. You'll have grace and favor with God and grace and favor with man. And so I is the letter in the middle of pride. And that's what pride is. I. May God break us of our pride. May God break us of selfish ambition, jealousy, slander, quarreling, all about promoting and pushing me higher. I want to be promoted. I want to be recognized. I, 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 want, I, want, I want what you have. I, I, want, I want to be proven right. I want to be lifted up. In all of that, God says, nah. Because the irony is that while pride seems to be lifting us up, it's actually taking us high enough to destroy us. And James is simply saying, we've received vertical grace, and now we need to show horizontal grace. And I pray the graciousness of God to cover you. To fill that every void, every hurt, every pain in your life. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Lord, I've trusted you with all of it. I pray that my heart honored you in every word. Even those stern words. Lord, forgive us for accusing, shaming hovering, lording over. Forgive us for our times we've manipulated, been hypocritical. Forgive us for the stones that we've thrown and the stones that we never caught. Forgive us for never getting in between the Pharisees and the broken because we were so caught up with ourselves and maybe we even stood with the Pharisees. We never want that for our lives. Some, we just didn't know any better because that's what we learned. Bad learned behavior. But Lord, today, we surrender our hearts to you afresh. Wanting to be more like you in every way. We want our, our believer and our behavior and behavior to be the same. So what we believe, we are actually walking out in life. I pray for healing for every single person this morning who has suffered, broken, inside. Forgiveness for the accuser. for the slanderer, for the jealous, for those who've... Lord, I ask you, Father, that you would wash all of us because all of us are guilty of something that inside of us isn't like you. Forgive us for not being more gracious. Not, forgive us for not being more merciful, more kind. 
And the world is looking for proof, not just words. They're tired of words. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, let healing begin in us. And I say, Lord, make us more like you. Help us to be consciously aware when we are not gracious. And thank you for your graciousness towards us. I'm going to ask you to stand just for a moment, Trey, just to lead us first for a moment. For those of you that are just at home, just take please just one moment just to lift your hands to him and begin to thank him for his grace over your life. And, and pray that this word has touched your heart to be more like Jesus. I, I know I'm far from it. But with every word ch is a challenge to me. May you give us more grace because we humbly come before you so that we can be givers of more grace to those around us. But Lord, we take this moment right now. We lift our hearts and our hands to you, asking you to do a work in us that only you can do. All of us have sinned and fallen short of your glory. And David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast, a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Let it begin in me. Let it begin in us. May we be like you, more gracious, more forgiving, God, we love you. And we are so far from perfect. And we need you daily. Every moment of the day. Change us. Change us to be more and more like you. So we offer this worship from a heart desperate for your grace. One of you that is just watching and I want to just make sure we're going to close in literally 60 seconds. We're going to end. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never surrendered your heart to God, or maybe it's been a long time, got hurt, walked away, I want you to know that he's never left you He's never forsaken you. He'll never leave you. He'll never abandon you. He's been with you, even in all of that foolish life and decisions you've made. He has walked with you right alongside of you, waiting for you to come home. And like the prodigal son, the father runs before the son ever gets to him. God loves you so much. At the age of 13, I prayed a simple prayer. And I said, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, to lock yourself in, and to throw the keys out. That simple prayer changed my life forever. I had no idea what God had planned for me. I didn't know what those words meant. I just knew I meant them from my heart. That today, if it's been a while since you've made him first, in your life come back to that first love because the plans that he has for you you'll never be able to dream them he has great things in store for you and it begins with just simply surrendering your heart 
a simple prayer as like as easy as this. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Lock yourself in and throw the keys out. Forgive me for all my sins. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and live your life in me every day, drawing me closer to you. And I will live my life for you the best I know how. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you've never read God's word, start in the book of John in the New Testament and just start there, verse by verse, and watch how God will transform your life with his love, his spirit, his grace. I love you guys so very much. Thank you for joining us. I know it's late, but thank you for hanging in there. Be gracious. Be gracious today. Tomorrow, walk in that grace and be great representatives of the Father who loves us so much. I'll see you guys next week. Communion next Sunday. So be ready. It's going to be a great week and a great day today. Happy Sunday, everybody. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you for giving. Thank you for standing with us. I love you. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are extremely grateful for everyone who supports us, whether it's by watching, praying, or even just being a part of our family. Because of the generosity of people like you, we're able to share this message of hope to people all around the world. If you'd like to be a part of what we're doing, we have a couple ways you can do so. You can text GIVE to the number below, click the link in our description, or visit tgporlando.com. We just want to thank you so much for being a part of our TGP family, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.